Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I'm here to help you finish your Christmas shopping list and let everyone else over there stiff arm their competition while trying to fight off that trip to fan on Turkey Night. Now, what we did was we partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get up to 75% off over 30,000 autographed sports collectibles during this holiday season. They have something for everyone. But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes so there are no extra markups, and they choose to then pass that savings on to you, the customer. Now, all orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. But hurry up because customers are so stark raving mad for RSA that memorabilia sells out daily. All you have to do is head over to shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Again, that's shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. So don't wait to bring home your favorites and own a piece of sports history for you and the loved ones on your shopping list this holiday season. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. The Rose Bowl. The game that inspired the college football bowl season has a long and storied history. The stadium itself is 100 years old, and in celebration of it, Pigskin Dispatch is assembling some of the top historians and authors to share the memories, people, and events that make the granddaddy of them all the special game that it is. Enjoy this Rose Bowl memory from pigskindispatch.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And we are right in the middle of Rose Bowl month, bringing on all these great guests, uh, historians, authors, people from all over football history to talk about this 100th anniversary of the venue that houses the Rose Bowl. Uh, some great things coming up, and we have a great guest tonight. We have Bob Swick, who is coming to us from Gridiron Legends Magazine, and has got uh, some great topics to talk about that uh, it really is quite interesting, and I can't wait to talk to him. Let's talk, bring him in right now. Uh, Bob Swick, welcome to the Pig Pen. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for having me on tonight. Yeah, Bob, it is such an honor to, to have you on here. Uh, you know, we corresponded a little bit here uh, before tonight, and uh, you have quite the resume in uh, football history. I was wondering, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the uh, things that you've done. Okay, um, well, just to give my background, I started buying my first football card, Black Spacks, back in 1965 when I was seven years old. And I never really stopped collecting football cards and football memorabilia. Football memorabilia is a very, very large area that encompasses a lot of different things and a lot of different aspects of the game of football per se. Football memorabilia includes all the different and great publications that are found in football, the Street and Smith Annuals, the uh, Peterson Annuals, the old Football Illustrated magazines. It also includes two of the, the basic collectibles from any football game. Sadly, both of them pretty much going by the wayside as uh, football teams go green. That's the football ticket and football ticket stub you get when to get into the game. And the other is an actual football program, which gives you the rosters of both teams playing and a lot of information about the uh, game itself and, uh, and advertising and so on and so forth. You also have the small pocket schedules, which teams used to uh, print in mass to try to get people and uh, uh, fans to come to the game so they would know which games would be home, which games would be away. They had a lot of different sponsors over the years for those different types of pocket schedules. You also had the beauty of a football media guide issued by most colleges and professional teams over the years 
Today, that's going to more of an online uh, format at the same time also. And you also have a lot of different football books and all the different things that have been written about football over the years. So to make a to, to try to summarize my background, when I was a small child back in 1967, my father and I were um, rope guards at the Yale Bowl in New Haven, Connecticut. I grew up in North Brantford, Connecticut, and uh, my father saw an ad in the paper saying that they were looking for rope guards uh, to stand and I'm sorry, sit by the ropes that separated general mission to the box seats in the Yale Bowl at that, that at that time. So in 1967, I was holding my father's hand walking into the Yale Bowl. I had never seen so many people in my life. And uh, I remember my father had a white shirt and tie on and his uh, fedora hat. And we walked in and uh, we got our assignment to sit. And we were in the corner of the end zone. And I was just so fascinated with the crowd. I was so fascinated with the game itself. And uh, my father had one uh, incident in which he, I never heard my father yell, and he yelled at these two college students trying to cross our rope, and he told them, get back, stay in your section. And I, I could, to this day, can hear him say that again. <laughs> and uh, that started a love affair of football where I was a, a king in our in our house watching in front of our black and white TV all the different college games on a Saturday and uh, believe it or not, free games on a Sunday between the American Football League and the National Football League. So it was, a, it was an incredible time for me growing up. And I just uh, kept up the love of the game over the years and uh, kept up my collection and collecting items over the years as far as football was concerned. In 1988, I uh, had my collection featured in the old Sports Collector's Digest newspaper, and in 1990, I started writing about football cards and football memorabilia and football publications. Uh, beginning in 1990, I wrote for them for Sports Collectors Digest in 1992. And then uh, in 1992 up to 1999, I self-published my own football newsletter called Bob Swick's Football Times. And then uh, starting in 2004, I started writing for Gridiron Greats Magazine, and in 2008, I took over the ownership and publication of the magazine, and I've been publishing it ever since. Wow, that is uh, quite the football resume there. You have been quite a busy uh, guy in your, your lifetime here in, uh, as a football fan and uh, a collector, so very interesting. Now, I, I had the opportunity of going to the Yale Bowl, so I can see wow, how it would seed uh, your passion for football, because that's quite a spectacular place for as old as it is but there's just something magical about that place it's really kind of kind of neat to go there it's it's a, it's a it was a great it is still a great venue to see a game in my opinion uh sadly you know it doesn't have the crowds like it used to have and Yale football dropped the division at the same time but uh i i've been there where where it was 80,000 people in in that in bowl uh, I've been there when there's only been maybe 5,000 people in the bowl, and it still never gets tiring to go see a game there. Uh, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed all the games I went to at the Yale Bowl over the years, but but the but strongest memories I have are with my father. As my father got older, one of the last games we attended, um, and he was the type of guy, he would always wear a shirt and tie to a game, uh, even in his uh, – in his last years of going to a game, and I remember one of the last games we w went to, he had a tough time walking at the end. And uh, I still remember uh, a couple of gentlemen there who were working at the bowl asked my father if he wanted a wheelchair, and he said, not on your life. I've been coming here since the 1930s, and, and I'm not going to walk. I'm going to keep walking here in and out. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was, it was just incredible to watch. But anyways, it's, it, it is a great venue to see a game. I've been to several different college stadiums, professional stadiums. Nothing matches for me the beauty of the Yale Bowl, uh, especially in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I'll bet. I've never been there at the actual game, but I had uh, some family that lives up there in New Haven, and actually one of them was an assistant coach at Yale once upon a time, and I, about 10 years ago, I got to take a tour of the, the Yale Bowl during the middle of the summer. You know, the grass was still growing and everything, but Got to yep. see the ins and outs of it. The thing that really surprised me, uh, we, I'm expecting going to see this, this stadium, you know, like you would, you would go to any other giant stadium, you know, being high off the ground. And 
only I mean, it's maybe what 25 feet off the ground level when you walk up to it from the outside. And that's right. one thing it really and been walking inside and you see and how vast it is. That's just incredible the architecture and the way it's laid out. So nothing like it. It's a, it's an amazing stadium. It's a truly amazing. Uh, years as, as years passed uh, through the magazine. Uh, my my wife does photography. We were asked by Yale to do a photo shoot photo shoot for them for one of the Princeton games. So we got out to go on the field and uh it was just an incredible experience to be on the field on a grass field like that, so close to the action. Uh truly an an amazing experience and uh it, it was amazing to be in the classic uh Yale press box at halftime also uh listening to the the chatter of the game and li- listening to the the uh, media at the time. So uh, great, great, great times, great experiences, great memories. Yeah, and it really it has a tie to our topic we're going to talk about here in a little bit, uh, the Rose Bowl, because that's how the bowl portion of the Rose Bowl uh, came about was from the Yale Bowl. So kind of an interesting tie in there to the stadium. But interesting you, you talked about that. No, I, I was going to say there is a, a, a very strong relationship with Yale Bowl. And the Rose Bowl at the same time, so it's 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 uh, very very interesting. And it and it's funny when we had talked previous about the Rose Bowl. I still remember one of the first bowl games I watched uh, was the Rose Bowl on TV. And I remember the the tournament of Rose Parade beforehand. They would broadcast it. And even though we had a black and white TV, I was still imagining all the red roses there, uh, which was uh, quite interesting. But the the, the gala of the Rose Bowl, the, the spectacle of it is just truly, uh, truly something to be a uh, sight to behold. Yeah, it, it definitely is. Okay, uh, so I guess let's get in, a little bit into your collecting uh, point uh, so that you, you made here. Now, I don't know much about collecting uh, these. You know, I guess most of it is uh, wasn't meant to be collected. It sounds like a lot of paper items, you know, programs and ticket subs and everything. So that's kind of a neat there that you, you save these things that uh, people were probably tossing away when they got done with the game or just leaving on their, their seat when they went and the guy cleaning up afterwards had to throw them away. So what makes a program or a ticket stub so desirable to want? Well, especially for the Rose Bowl, there there have been so many classic games and so many classic matchups. In collecting, there's a lot of college uh, team specific collectors, meaning that someone who attended USC, uh, has a side collection of USC, uh, sports programs uh, from football, basketball, so on and so forth. The Rose Bowl makes it special if your team, your college team ends up playing there. And as such, it becomes a, a very, very, uh, desired collectible, especially if you're collecting a, the ticket and the program and a lot of collectors prefer collecting both because it is symbolic of the game it is a, a, a direct historical piece to the game and as time goes on the older the item that you're collecting in a football program or a uh, ticket stub becomes more and more scarce in my opinion especially items before world war ii because a lot of that stuff that did survive ended up going into the World War II paper drives, which were well known at the time, and uh, went to recycling and, and are gone forever. I'll give one big example as far as the collectible is concerned. One of the items that is very much in demand and is very, very expensive is the 1925 game between Notre Dame and Stanford. Uh, there's a lot of Notre Dame college uh, football collectors out there. So that's a very desirable ticket stub and very desirable program for collectors, especially for Notre Dame collectors at the same time. And um, there's always a big uh, Michigan presence in collecting. And, again, uh, for the games that the uh, Michigan Wolverines played in, those games are very collectible at the same time also. Those ticket stubs and programs are very des- uh, desirable at the same time. Yeah, I can imagine that 1925 Rose Bowl. You know, that's the four horsemen with Notre Dame and Ernie Nevers with Stanford. You know, some great players and, uh, you know, mark- two marquee teams playing there. And just uh, those teams that still live on, you know, 100 years later, we we still know about them today. So I can imagine that's a pretty desirable one. 
that sort of like the, the holy grail of Rose Bowl collectibles? Is that that game, you think? You know, I, I was thinking about that, and I'm saying that to me there's several different holy grails. Um, the first and biggest holy grail, in my opinion, is from the first game in 1902, in which we really don't know if anything actually exists from the game. Um, I've talked to many people, um, co- many collectors who said they've never seen a ticket uh, from that game, and they and I guess there's in several of the very early games from 1916 uh, through the late 1920s, there may only be one ticket actually in existence or one program in actual existence, and they may be in the university's archives. So uh, as far as the Holy Grail, I think one of the closest Holy Grails to me is that 1925 game between Notre Dame and Stanford, and with especially with the historical presence of the Four Horsemen, uh, it makes it even more uh, a desirable collectible and more of a holy grail type of collectible. Now, now was there any, uh, let's talk about the 1925 ticket stuff. Was there any like special graphics? I know sometimes they would put some, you know, some commemorative picture or, or drawing on, on there, or is it just a uh, plain ticket stuff? I'm just, if you could maybe well, describe. There, 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 there is some ornateness to them because the classic ticket stubs of the 19, of the 1900s, the 1910s, the 1920s, uh, did have a, a very, very, uh, noticeable or different type of color scheme as compared to the traditional black and white, uh, that you saw in some different ticket stubs at the same time. And as such, uh, the Rose Bowl traditionally has had something, uh, some sort of symbol of a rose with the bowl on the ticket and on the program over the years, uh, which to give it, give it more, uh, present and more, um, uh, of a, of a tie in to the game itself. I'm looking at right now, um, a, a, the later program that I have from the Rose Bowl. It's the 82nd Rose Bowl game between USC and Northwestern from 1996. Uh, the reason why I have that program is my daughter went to graduate school at Northwestern, and I started a, a little small collection of Northwestern items uh, when she was going to school there. And this was back in the the early 2000s. But anyways, I, I found that program. I thought it was it was a very interesting program. You had two childhood um, two childhood uh, kids throwing the football with one another with the background of the uh, Rose Bowl. Uh, and the 50 year 1946 to 1996 partnership for 50 years with the classic Rose Bowl design that, uh, I saw on your, on your background there. And it, it's a, it's a, a very memorable program because it is the 50th year from the 1946 agreement between the Big Ten and the PAC, uh, conference at that time ought to be pretty much, uh, thrown by the wayside once the bowl championships came in. So it's an interesting program, but a lot of the, the classic Rose Bowl programs and Rose Bowl came back to the tickets have very an or, ornate design to them, a very classical, uh, traditional type of design, which makes them uh, very attractive to look at if you're a collector and very collectible at the same time. Yes, yeah, so some of the tickets and program covers, you know, the artwork on them, I mean, they're, they're really works of art. You know, they could be museum pieces. It's just uh, it's fascinating to, to look at. And I could look at some of those for, for hours because there's so much detail into the artistry of the, the, these folks that they had draw some of these things up back in the day. They don't, they don't do it like that anymore. Yeah, today it's, it's much more standardized. It's, it's much more, um, it's almost like a corporate feel to them uh, than anything else. For example, in 1952, you have a beautiful uh, uh, drawing of um, or artwork of the uh, Illinois-Stanford game in which you see a, a classic cover of the roses on it, the two team names, and the two uh, two players, one from each team, going after a football. It's that kind of stuff that I think represents – uh, why a lot of collectors appreciate that, number one, as almost like an art form and the history and, and the, the background of what the game, what the game was at the same time, which is why they collect it also. 
Ah, very interesting. So what are some of the more unique uh, Rose Bowl items that you've come across in seeing either in your own collection or other folks' collections that you've seen? Well, the one thing, the two things that um, I think are very collectible, which are technically non-paper items, are pennants from the game and buttons from the game. It was for many years uh, buttons were produced for the game, and when people went to a game, they would wear a button of their favorite team. So they would, they would have, for example, in 1952, you would have a Rose Bowl pin for Illinois, and you would have a Rose Bowl pin for Stanford. And if you were, you know, depending on which team you, you were uh, cheering for, you would buy the button and wear it proudly for the game. Those have become very collectible over the years. I don't see a lot of them anymore, but I've, I've handled over the years, many different bowl game pins, including several Rose Bowl ones. The reason why I bring up the 1952 one is I, I did have that at one time, and I, and I did sell it off uh, quite a few years back. Pennants are, were another big thing, especially through the 1960s and 70s, uh, and also in the 40s and 50s. And the older pennants were considered felt pennants because of the materials of felt uh Felt material used with a sc- uh, screen printing of the teams or of the Rose Bowl or whatever on the front of it, and especially a lot of kids that used to love buying the pennants and they would wave the pennants during the game, so on and so forth. That's again something you don't see at a game today anymore. Uh, and uh, I also remember when I was a kid, I bugged my father and he let me buy a Yale pennant. Uh, so I have a, a basically a 1967 felt Yale pennant blue with the white lettering, uh, which is just a classic, classic design of a, a traditional pennant from the 1960s. So the other two big collectibles for the Rose Bowls uh, are both Rose Bowl pins and Rose Bowl pennants, which are, are very, very um, collectible and, and in demand by certain uh, for certain uh, collectors. Well, I'm not a collector, but I can tell you what, just the way you described it, I'm intrigued by both the items and even some of the paper items you've talked about. So it sounds very interesting indeed and uh, really a, a great uh, thing to collect. You know, it's, it ties you right in with the football history, especially some of the descriptions you're talking about, some of the, the players being on there and the, the team names and things like that. So um, now you have uh, – you know, ownership of this uh, magazine. Maybe you could tell the listeners a little bit about the magazine, and you also have a podcast that goes along with it? Yes. Uh, we publish Grid Iron Greats magazine quarterly, four times a year. Our next uh, issue, which will be the winter issue, will be out the second week of January. We write about a variety of football uh, subjects, players, uh, games, collectibles, so on and so forth. And we cover the, the, whole, the whole realm of football history, uh, as I say, we cover 150 plus years of football history and memorabilia from 1869 literally to the current day. We, we usually end up in the 1990s or early 2000s of what we cover and what we write about. Uh, we have uh, uh, many well known collectors uh, throughout our country, uh, people like John Spano, Jeff Payne, uh, Martin Jacobs, who is a super collector for the San Francisco 49ers. They all contribute to our magazine and uh, it's a labor of love to say the say the least I had a, a well-known auctioneer uh, auction house who I had on my podcast who advertises with us and he said straight out you're a boutique publication and that kind of stuck with me because we are a specialty publication in an era where paper is um, looked down upon for whatever reason we still print a a regular print issue. We also have a PDF version uh, for the magazine. And uh, we're on our 79th issue uh, with the, our next issue. I took over at issue number 23 back in 2008, and we've been going strong since then. We also have a podcast that we uh, have normally two shows a month in which we interview a collector and or someone involved in football, writing, collecting, uh, and or uh, a football type website for collectibles or history, and uh, we try to expand uh, everyone's knowledge on football collecting and memorabilia as much as we can. And it's the Gridiron Greats podcast, and you just type that in dot com, and you can you can pick up our shows there. Okay. We also have a regular 
We also have a regular website for the magazine, gridirongreatsmagazine.com. Okay, that was my next question, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> so excellent. Uh, and, and folks, if you're, you're driving in the car and you don't have a pen or pencil, we will make sure we put some links uh, in the show notes of this podcast so you can get in touch uh, with what Bob has going over there at Gridiron Greats Magazine in the podcast. So we'll get you connected that way too. So, Bob, we thank you very much for uh, coming on and telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, about your, your products and the Gridiron Greats, and uh, sharing some of this Rose Bowl memories here as we celebrate the Rose Bowl's 100th anniversary. So appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much for having me on. It was great. We're taking a peek over at the chains and the down marker. It's fourth and long. We're going to have to punt the ball and get on out of here, but we'll have another series tomorrow for your football history headlines, so be sure to tune in. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleat Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. Pigskindispatch.com is a proud affiliate of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment. You know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website. But we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, Fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.